There's a lot to be said for the wind. <laughs> I had to stop a video recording just now because the wind was blowing so dramatically that it had caused my background behind the camera to get loose and almost knock the camera over. But one of the things that would be a great study is wind, you know, how it blows over, blows through, blows apart, can shake things, can twist things, lift things up, toss them over, can do all kinds of things. And I'm fascinated because lately I've been seeing some of the things that happen in my devotional in my life. But that always happens for me. Everything in my life is a devotion because it seems to be the realization that God is working in my life according to his word as he's giving it to me, not just in the word of God, but also in my devotional. So a lot of times what I'm living through is what I'm teaching. And what I'm teaching through is what I'm living. And what I'm going through are the same things that you and I both encounter every day in life. And that is those personal applications of the realization of God living in us, God living with us, and God working through us in order to accomplish His will and not our will be done. So I'm always interested when I see someone not doing His will or going against the Word of God. I had an interesting opportunity to listen to a gentleman from the military, and I, I already know I've been in the military. I know what a military attitude is or action is. You know, it's like Semper Fi, you know, and all this kind of pride and of life, you know. And there's a good thing to the military, you know. It's a necessary evil, as one great general said from the Civil War. Um, many people have always commented throughout time how, because of the inhumanity of man, man deals with man inhumanely, and we call it war. So, because of that, we have military. But the point being is that. In respect to relationships, that's not what God intends for us to do. God has already laid out for us what a relationship should be in the realization of Matthew, um, I think 5, 6, and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount of how we should be treating our enemies as opposed to how we are dealing with our enemies today. Today we're often killing them rather than be killed. Kill or be killed. You know, oh no, fight or flight. You know, oh no, we don't, we don't fight, we fight. We stand up for our rights. We, matter of fact, get them before they get us. And if they got us, we're going to get them back. Now, turning the other cheek is not an American virtue. It's a Christian virtue. Americans are all about... And you figure that one out. But Tozer was confronting an interesting issue was that there are a couple things that happen in Christianity. You know, you could get someone saved you know, in the military. God bless them, you know. And then now in our current climate, people think that the military is the ultimate godlike job or performance of God's will, and that being a military man, hey, if you see those stars and stripes coming, then you know that God is with you, and you know that God is delivering you because he sent our military for you. And I read that post, and I saw something like that, and I thought, huh, really? <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> Are you that serious? Are you that brainwashed? I mean, I was amazed at how much so someone who was older in the military, knowing full well that there are times when the military's right and sometimes when the military's wrong, when there are things that are unjust in the military and there are things that are just. The military is like any other societal organization. It needs Jesus or it fails. And so the reality of having to live inside the military as a Christian is a very challenging place to be. Because the only thing that I posted originally in response to something about, you know, Semper Fi or being faithful or doing, you know, the 101st Airborne or whatever, you know, military service you're in, the Navy, you know, and I know a friend of mine that's really Navy gung-ho and he's all into, you know, shoot them and blow them apart. You know, even though he doesn't own a gun, he just likes to get apart and, you know, kind of like feel like, nuke them all, let God sort them out, like I used to say. But the reality of where we should be, of what we could be, and how we ought to be, is like Jesus. Jesus didn't kill people. He wasn't out to murder someone or defend himself. As a matter of fact, he taught his disciples the opposite extreme, and that's why they were crucified. 
They could have taken up a sword. And no, Jesus didn't tell them to go out and buy swords so that they could defend themselves and do all this stuff. He told them to go out and buy a sword because the prophecy needed to be fulfilled that the one would come out and cut his arm, cut his ear, you know, and he would heal the hearing of the priest, you know, and it would be something that was a demonstration of what a prophecy would be fulfilled. And, you know, long story short is that it was like, you know, they have two swords and they didn't go out and buy one. He says, that's enough, you know, and if you got 12 disciples, how could two swords be enough? So if you really do a Bible study on it, you'll figure out why that's not advocating violence. It was making sure, just like having a donkey in order to ride into Jerusalem, that there was a sword on hand in order to fulfill what was about to occur. And so, that being said, while we may have great respect for those men in service that are doing their part to ensure the security of some type, you know, for the nation, that doesn't mean that's the best allocation. And, you know, that was what was the point being made. I said, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be a man in the military, and it's wonderful to be, you know, under orders, but there are times where if you are given orders, you have the right to refuse an order in the military. According to the Uniform Code of Military Justice, if something goes against your principles, against something that you can demonstrate in court, of course, that it is absolutely wrong, you can go up the mast. You can go before the mast. You can, you can go up the chain of command and fight not to do that part that you're being told to do. Good luck, but, you know, it's there on the books anyways. Well, the person took exception with that and said, no, you know, it's, it's like, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're godly and we're nations of godly men, you know, so we're, we're God's army, you know. Um, and I just started smiling. I was like, yeah, right. Whether we call it Vietnam or Afghanistan or Korea and all these places where we've gone in, you know, and went out and gone back in and went back out and did all these secret things behind the scenes, you know, and whether, whether we are using drones to kill innocent people as well as the victim, you know, of our attack. You know, because we're saying it's a godly war, you know. It's like, I don't think so. So I use the extreme example of, you know, like going to Megiddo. You know, like if you get orders to go to Megiddo, you know, I don't recommend you follow them. Of course, you know, you do God first and then follow your orders. You know, point being is always pray, always seek a relationship with God first, then do what your commanders say, your military commanders. Because if you don't do what your commanders say, or if God does tell you to disobey an order, Hey, God will take care of you, but you will wind up in military prison or jail or court-martial or drummed out of the service. So, I found that interesting that the person couldn't come to that conclusion at all. There was no realization of that whatsoever. And I thought, that's interesting because there's also the same type of attitude that goes on in the Christian world, in the religious life, where we say, oh, you're disagreeing with me? Hey, don't judge me, brother. Huh, huh, I got my relationship. Oh, you can't, you can't talk to me. Oh, no, 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 no. Get back with that Bible. Uh, 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 you don't know where I've been. You haven't walked out of my shoes. <laughs> right. Praise the Lord. I haven't walked in your shoes. But you see, one of the things that I've always done in every video, in every comment, in every word that I'll put out there on the internet and in every teaching and in every realization of God in my life, it's always one thing that it boils down to. And it boils down pretty simply to it. Whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. Because if you're doing it without asking God, you're a fool because you're doing it on your own. And that's not a good place to be. But when you're doing it with God, if God has told you to, then you're on sound doctrine. You're on sound footing. You will have the winds and storms of life come upon you, like Jesus said, and your house won't be shaken. But if you're not doing the things that Jesus said, if you're not asking him, seeking him, knocking him, knowing his voice, and hearing him, and letting him direct you, as he says, he'll whisper in your ear, talk in your heart, be a still small voice, then guess what? Hello? You're doing it on your own. You're making up what you think you should do and then calling upon faith to make God do what you think he's doing for you. Wow! I don't know if that's like the deaf leading the blind or the blind leading the deaf. One of the two are really going to fall into the pit. The other one's going to follow right after them. Because it's kind of ignorant to think that we can make for ourselves determinations of realizations of how God is speaking by never asking Him and never hearing from Him 
and never talking to him and never getting a word from him. That's stupid. I mean, it would come, I wanted to say sublime idiocy, but you know, sometimes people think I use too big of words. But the reality of what we should be doing is simply this. I'm not judging you, bro. I'm just telling you, look. Take a second look. Check it out. Did you pray about it? No? <laughs> okay. You know, I used to have a pastor that used to teach me this methodology of how to counsel. It was very simple. I mean, he was very cut and dry about it, too. If you went in for counseling to him, the first question he asked you is, first of all, you know, are you are you living in sin? You know, no, I'm kidding. But are you living in sin? You know, if you were two people going in, believe me, he's going to ask you, are you married? You know, and then, are you living in sin? You know, get out. You know, because until you're willing to get serious about it, you know, no counseling is going to help you. And the reality, of what he would ask you is a pretty simple question. The first one was, did you read your Bible today? I mean, because to put it bluntly, if you haven't read your Bible, how are you hearing from God? Period. I mean. Sure, I believe that God can speak to you direct. So that is a Bible in and of itself in some ways. And, you know, if you explained it to Romaine, he probably would have agreed with you, you know, that God, you know, speaking to you, and, and, you know, and he'd take you through some other scriptures too, but I'll go with you on that. You know, if you talk to God and God told you to do it, by all means, go for it. He's the one who's going to justify you, or he's going to be the one to condemn you by way of, did he tell you those things to do? Or did he not? And since he usually doesn't contradict scripture, although I can pretty much say there's some pretty interesting places where it looks a little contradictory, <laughs> depending on your perspective, yeah. be careful that you'll find yourself in contradictory cir circumstances and, and situations, even as Abraham did when he was told to go and offer his only son, Isaac. First of all, he should argue with God and say, What do you mean, my only son? My only son? That's not my only son. But he took his son, the son of promise, as we know, and we learned a lot from it. And the demonstration of it was that it didn't work out the way he thought it would, but it worked out the way that God wanted it to. And then, by faith, we can accept the fact that Abraham knew God was going to take care of it, no matter what way it went, and how it worked out to do what God wanted him to do. And so, the same is true in our life, is that we don't know what God is getting to, or getting to, from us or wanting from us unless we talk to him, unless we direct the attention and the focus of our spirit in every circumstance and situation of our life in order to ask him, did you want me to go that extra mile, you know, and then the second mile, the third mile, did you ask him along the way, you know, I mean, to put it bluntly, it's not just simply about, hey God, you know, there you are and here I am and I'm on my way and guess what, you find me whenever you can, maybe on Sunday, no. And that's kind of what Tozer is driving at in his teaching. He's trying to get us to the realization that, hey, get a grip, get a handle on this, understand its relationship, and it's not about, no, brother, you can't judge me, no, bro, you know, get away from me, oh, no, don't talk to me, man, you don't know where I've been. You're right, I don't know where you've been, I don't want to know. Whoo, it's stinking. But the point is, the direction you're going to, we can talk about and carry it through to see where it will go if you're heading in that direction. Because I can ask a person very clearly, hey look, have you thought it out? What is the extension of what you're doing? You know, if you're believing in this part of legalism, then guess what? What are you going to get at the end of legalism? How many laws are 613? Did you check and see if there were more than that? Because there are. Are there more than 613? Of course there are. They were made up in the first place. Hello? So, we can add some more. And that's what they do. And they add more and more and more. And it gets pretty crazy. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's kind of what the government does today. <laughs> Adds more and more and more. Well, we got a situation here. we got to figure out how to interpret it. You know, So we got to go to the court, Supreme Court. Supreme Court says, no, that's not a good law. Well, then we'll make another law and change that law so that we can make another law. And that's how it comes sometimes people are going over this abortion issue over and over and over again. They just keep doing more laws. They're never going to solve it. You don't legislate morality, you legislate law. And that's what law does. Law is legislature of law. That's it. Law after law after law after law after law. That's what it's going to do. It's called governance. But when you have the right attitude in your heart, then you need no governance. You are free from the legality because the 
attitude will cause your direction to be in the right way, and you'll not break those laws that, quote unquote, governance has placed over you in order to create for you a means of dealing with society that you live in according to those legislated governances that you call the law. And so Tozer addresses what we see in life today. Polite society, religion must not get personal. No, 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 no. And their words seem to them as to idle tales and they believe them not, Luke 24, 11. I remind you that it is a characteristic of the natural man to keep himself so busy with unimportant trifles that he is able to avoid, able to avoid settling the most important matters relating to life and existence. Men and women will gather anywhere and everywhere to talk about every subject under the latest fashions up to Plato and philosophy and up and down the scale from football to baseball to basketball to what she wearing, what's he wearing, who said what, did they do this, and what's the latest episode of General Hospital or One Life to Live. But God knows what happened in church, I don't know. But you know, somewhere along the line we forgot what the pastor said. We forgot what we were studying. We don't even have a daily devotional. But if I did, I'd tell you what it said. Word for word. Now, how did it apply? Oh, I don't know. I don't apply those things. I just read them. Oh, okay. What did God tell you today? You know, there are people that literally will not get out of bed until they roll over, look up at God and say, God, I'm not getting out of this bed until you tell me to. Literally. That's the way it should be. Because you see, you should have an ongoing relationship of communication, not just a, oh, well, you know, I'll bless the food before, or I'll bless the food after, or I'll say grace, or I won't say grace, or I'll be thankful, or I won't be thankful, or I'll, you know, dob it and whip and whap and, you know, get down on my knees and, you know, do my prayer shawl or do my prayer rug, either one, you know, and find myself, quote, unquote, religiously doing something that I'm still not connected so you see, the interpersonal relationship is one of interconnectivity. If you're not getting an answer, you're not getting a relationship. That's the way it works. There has to be that two-way street, not just a one-way <laughs> casting out of something that you're verbalizing that you say is prayer. There has to be more to it than that. It should be communicative, not just directive. They talk about the necessity for peace. They may talk about the church and how it can be a bulwark against communism. They might talk about how bad the presidency is and how they need to get involved in some issue. Oh, we've got to sign a petition. We've got to get involved in our local community outreach. We've got to be more active in the issues we're facing in democracy. None of these things are embarrassing subjects. But the conversation all stops and the taboo of silence becomes effective when someone or anyone dares to suggest that our spiritual subjects of vital importance to our souls that ought to be discussed and considered. I know very clearly, you know, I can say the word President Obama and I can watch half a dozen people sin immediately. No problem there. Man, they just blew it. You know, their attitude went right out the window. They're immediately jumping on the bandwagon about, well, he's not a Christian. He's a Muslim. No, he's not a Muslim. He wasn't born. No, he's not born there. He's born here. He's born somewhere. You realize just how stupid that really sounds? How dumb it really is? And that's just about the president. My God, we can talk about other things, you know, like the marriage bed is undefiled. Oh, no, don't go to the marriage bed. We've been doing some real perverse things in that bed, so we're not going to talk about that one. That's too personal. I don't want to get real about what kind of pervert I am, even though... Uh, I'm in my 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth divorce. Or, you know, I really married a stripper because that's what I wanted in my bedroom. What are you doing? Where are you at? God knows. Be real. Be honest. Are we willing to talk about those subjects? Are we willing to discuss how you may be heading in the wrong direction on certain attitudes and actions? I know for a fact, if I started talking about guns and give up your guns, whoa, you've got 
eighty percent of christianity thinking violence is an answer and that self defense is a motivational factor for having a gun wow really how about no defense but god is your office and that prayer is your self defense sorry too personal and go in there that requires me to make a sacrifice that requires me to deny myself. That requires me to do something like, you know, crawl on a cross and die like Jesus. That's not for me. I'm sorry. That's too personal. Get out of my life. You can't judge me, brother. You know, that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be a police officer and shoot someone. Or I'm called to be a soldier and kill someone. I'm called to do every other thing except for that which personally challenges me in my life to get more personal and real with God than I've ever had to before. And that's what Tozer's talking about. What? is your stumbling block when it comes to being personal with God. What aren't you willing to do with God or talk about to another Christian? Is your pornography really that important? Is your abuse of wife really something you won't talk about? Or your abuse of your privileges to go have very many more drinks than what we would say an alcoholic has? I only got one or two DUIs. Really? It's not that bad. You know, I mean, I've never got caught. Really? Well, you know, it's not drugs. You know, it's just kind of like an energy drink. You know? Yeah, I drink six or seven of them a day. Really? You're not an addict. These are the things that souls ought to be discussing and considering. There seems to be an unwritten rule in polite society that if any religious subjects are to be discussed, it must be within the framework of theory. And, oh no, never let it get personal. One of the things that I hated about my early Christian walk, and I hated it with a purple passion. I mean purple passion. But I did it. And sometimes I still do it. <laughs> I still hate it. <laughs> but I do, I hate it. But I have the ability to be honest. I do. I mean, it's a gift. It's not something I want to do. God knows I'd rather lie. I'm pretty good at lying. Matter of fact, my family was born liars. Seriously. You know, my middle name is Jacob, or James, you know, which is a form of Jacob. But hey, my middle name is Jacob. You want to know about lying? I know about lying. I mean, for me, and this is why I, I don't do sales, I never have done sales, or since my vow, but back when, right after I got saved, I was backslidden for, I think maybe the first time, you know, that I was backslidden, but I went kind of away from the Lord, you know, and wouldn't talk to Him, and, you know, kind of didn't walk with Him, you know, and God's still there. I mean, I knew that. I could still feel him. He was still trying to get my attention. And I was like, no, fine, Lord, I'm not talking to you. Leave me alone. You know, and I was at that attitude. But I got involved in sales. You know, and I was doing custom sales, meaning that I was doing wholesale retail at a time when, you know, it was like still small in Southern California. We used to get sunglasses off of the L.A. Harbor, you know, for like a penny apiece, you know, and then we would mark them up for our wholesale cost. You know, say they were three ninety nine, so automatically instead of them being a penny piece, we were saying each individual glass was like three ninety nine. Then we would mark them up, you know, in whichever venue they were, if we were selling them like at Circle K or Seven Eleven or Alpha Beta or someplace, we would mark them up to like, you know, six ninety nine, seven ninety nine, twelve ninety nine. The punk rock glasses were going for like, you know, probably eight ninety nine, nine ninety nine. And so we would split that fifty percent you know, hundred percent commission, fifty percent um to the retailer, and so the retailer would, you know, we would handle all of it. We would put up the racks and the sunglasses, and we would absorb all the loss, you know, penny a piece, who cares? But the point is, is that we would say that the loss was like three ninety nine, you know, because it was at or two ninety nine, whichever one it was at the time, you know, for the wholesale cost. So that was like, you know, we're losing two ninety nine, and we'd show them all the books. Yeah, we lost two ninety nine. You know. That wasn't our cost. We just added, you know, as though it were our 
labor, our time, our effort, our gas to go down to the LA Harbor in order to get them, you know, in order to pick them up and take them over, you know, and put little labels on them, you know, and then pass them out and put them up in the rack, you know, and we serviced them, so we did all that paperwork for them. They just had to give us the space to sell them, and then we gave them their cut, which really was basically 50% off of the $2.99 to $6.99, so $4, we get $2 off that, they get $2 off that, basically. You know, so really marked up at the beginning and marked up at the end, and in between they get you know, a certain percentage. Meanwhile, we're making money on both ends. And so I was involved in that. <laughs> Sales. And I, I was the person who, with my, my partner, I opened up the sales. He was the one who had this all, you know, knew where to go get them and all that stuff. And then he hired me and said, look, this is all you got to do. Go into a Circle K, talk to the manager, set up the rack. He'll, you know, set you up a rack right there on the counter. He'll let you service it, blah, blah, blah. That's okay. I opened up probably 30 accounts per day. And I was making, oh, I don't know, about $1,200 cash, technically. Maybe not cash, but, you know, I had to pay income tax on it. But, you know, I was making $1,200 a week, approximately with a week, I don't know, I was making a bundle of money at that time. For a while, in a short period of season, you know, while I was doing this wholesale retail thing, and I was amazed at how much money I had. I was able to buy things, do things, and have friends, and do all kinds of things. But I was lying to every single person I walked into that story, because I would just see what their personality type was like, and I use some of the gifts of the spirit, so to speak, you know, and I said, well, you know, kind of, you know, they can see what they're doing, you know, so I'm like, all right, you know, I'd go back in the next day and I'd come in a suit, another day I'd come in with a, you know, sloppy or, you know, like rapid or Latino or, you know, like a Vietnamese or whatever it may have been, you know, the person that I was talking to, I customized my sales approach to, kind of like madman, only worse, I was like insane man because I had a 100% success rate, and because of my 100% success rate, you know, I was in demand. And I knew that I was like, wow, king of the hill. And I was good. And to this day, you know, some people would say, well, that's what you're doing on video. No, I'm not. I'm totally honest on video. I am not a salesman. Believe me. What you see is what you get. This is not what I'm talking about when I'm putting on a persona. <laughs> Believe me, I can put on a persona. Hey, man, you know what? you got to get these jobs. It's not men. It's so cool. You know, it's like, hey, man, you know, like the glasses, they just get so well. You know, like we got them and we got to go down and get them from the hobo. You know, from the hobo, you can go down to the the street, man, you get it down the street, you go to, you know, kind of, you know, whatever, you know, the time. But the point, I woke up one day, you know, looked at my life, looked in the mirror and said, you're a liar. You know, all of it was phony. All of it was just meaningless, purposeless. It didn't take me long. It only took me about four months, you know, and I gave up on it. But, um, you know, I walked away from it all. Of course, I did take all my clothes. I had a lot of clothes. I used to wear all these different custom clothes. But um, from Southern California, I said, you know what? Because I'd grown up there, too. I was superficial. I was one of those Southern California sons, you know, and just like every other one of them that was from more down there. Just worthless, meaningless, didn't know the meaning of the word work. Because, quite frankly, most people down in Southern California are superficial. That's all they are is just surface, no depth. So I left all that and went to Oregon. And boy, did I get a rude awakening. God decided to take me into work, and I loved it. I found out and made for my way as a young man the meaning of life in hard, sweaty, working labor. But, you know, I had turned my back on that type of sales position, that type of work, that type of environment, and said I would never sell again. And to me, every salesman is a liar. You know, I don't care what kind of salesman you are. I'm just, you want to have a Bible study on it, you're a liar. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> But, you know, you could, you could try to convince me that you're not, you know, I'll go, okay, you know, we could take some time to get you to the place, but you're going to agree with me sooner or later. I don't care if you're selling Amway or some Christian product, you know, the salesmen are liars. Yeah, they are. Oh, yeah, <laughs> no problem there. And a lot of people are, because they put out their sales. But my point being was that... That type of environment, I swore up and down, I would not lie. And from that moment on, I swore I would never, and I made a vow to the Lord, that I would never do sales. And I haven't. I won't do sales. I won't sell things. I won't, you know, exaggerate them. You know, I won't create ad copy or do anything for them in that way. That's, you know, misleading or misrepresentation. Because it taught me just what the meaning of that was, and I was so good at it that I hated myself in the end for it. But that's why... 
there has to be that type of personification, personalizing of conversation that we have to be able to get to the reality of talking to each other face to face, your place, my place, you do it, I do it, we get it, got it, so that we'll go forward and be real with our God as opposed to being, you know, yeah, you know, there was such a shock. I was so amazed, you know. Gosh, did you hear the latest? The pastor ran off with the secretary. I never saw it coming. Please. Oh, Jim Baker fell from grace. Please. Oh, these people were doing this, that, and the other thing, and now it's like such a shock. I'm so amazed. Please. The reality of fact of whether you're personally real or not is determined exactly by those statements, whether or not you're shocked, surprised, acting like it, or really are. Because the point being is that we should let it get personal, as Tozer says. There ought to be souls that we could discuss with and share our intimate, most deepest problems and not shock the shorts out of everyone. Because that's what happened when I got to Oregon, was that I was brought to a place where God said, now, Michael, I want to use you in a way that you've never thought of being used before. I want you to tell your story. And I went, and at that time I was still shy, so I didn't do much talking in the churches. And the church I went to was a little tiny community church. And so God said, you know, I want you to open up to these people. And I went, uh-uh, no, 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 not me, man. <laughs> Wrong person. Because I'd gone through some dramatic surgeries where they had cut up my gut, you know, and that's kind of what this is. It's like, you know, there's kind of like this big old scar right here, you know, and it's like, you know, big old, you know, took some big old pliers, pulled them back. Well, the bottom line is that I have an ostomy. I have a bag on my side. I have a, what's called an ileostomy. That means that, you know, for a lot of men, their life ended because there are a lot of men that are weenies. <laughs> I grew up with, you know, thank God, you know, when I had the surgery down in Balboa Naval Hospital, I grew up with people like Ralph Benershka, who was the, the field goal kicker for the San Diego Chargers, you know. He had an ostomy, you know, while he was playing football. Hello? You know, and there were a lot of people that have ostomies that, you know, did sports and won Olympic medals and did all kinds of things that you wouldn't have known unless you were involved in that. Because most of us were kind of like shy, you know, kind of intimidated. Well, God wanted me to use that opening to help break down some of the stereotypes that the people in this town had because the town that I was living in had stated publicly in the newspaper all the way across the, the, the headlines handicapped people need to stay, stay at home where they belong and believe me it's been not that long ago that you started seeing handicapped people come out of the woodwork and be accepted in society but that long ago where they were rejected completely and told to Get out. Get away. Ooh, weird, strange, bizarre. The curse of God is on you. You should be healthy. You know, you got sin in your life if you're not healed. I mean, all those things were running around. So, in this church, God used my importunity, meaning that my disability with Crohn's and with having an ostomy and having surgery, to begin to open up and to tell these people, hey, look at me. You know, I said... I don't know how to talk to you guys you know, because I I have an ostomy and sometimes when I have the ostomy you know I have like a, a problem with it where it will you know like like gurgle or it'll make a noise you know and we'll be in prayer you know we'll all be close together and I feel really really intimidated and I feel really you know like shy and I feel really embarrassed by it and it just terrifies me it scares me to death you know that you know people are gonna like wonder if I if I passed gas or if I, you know, had fluctuation or something, and you can't because it's like Joe Contain. So it's always interesting that God would use me in that way for a lot of things to break down walls where other people began to open up. And as they did, this church began to grow. And as the church began to grow, then they became more intimate one with another. And that's the reason why Tozer is bringing up this intimacy thing, this personalization thing, this idea of being the person of and talking about people getting real. Because until you admit your faults one to another, you're not being real. You're just covering your mistakes, covering your attitudes, covering your actions with the veneer of religiosity without there being that integrity of the fact that you are a sinner saved by grace and you've got issues that you're not admitting one to another. And that's why 
Tozer especially wants us to fight against those things, to be real one with another, to open up our own failings so that we can encourage each other to succeed in those areas when we are weak, that the other may be strong. That we might find the means to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another without it sounding so religiously generalization that it has nothing to do personally with you or with me. Because, ah, been there, you know, all right, fine, go away. Not me, brother. You know, I'm not there. No, uh, it's not for me. It must be someone else. No, 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 down the road, you know, somebody else. No. God is personal. God is real. God's dealing with you. Just like he deals with me. Just like he deals with the pastor and with the elder, and they've all got issues. You know, and they'll, at different times, I hope, discuss their personal issues, you know, maybe with a few people, you know, that they can, you know, feel comfortable with without blowing the doors off the church. Or if they're like me, you know, and if they were in charge of a church, you know, and just able to share it all, they'll just let it all out, you know, and share it. Because that is the reality of knowing God and not being afraid to stand in faith with God before all the peoples and admit who you are so that you might be knit together in love with the bonds that God wanted us to have when Jesus prayed that they will know you are my disciples indeed. In that, you have love for one another. Because until you get real with your failings, you'll never be real about your success.